chapter 10, the great book of Genesis, in the beginning. The Hebrew word, which is to say, uh, as it was in the beginning. And we, we're at this 10th chapter, and we have Noah. He's survived the flood along with his family. And two of every flesh. It so happens that all of the six-day creation, which are all the races of the world, were flesh, and they also were there. But there were only eight Adamic souls aboard the ark. And we're going through, and of course, we, we learned in, in this 10th uh, chapter that uh, we did have the Gentiles with us, and certainly um, they were inner, had uh, come along with the, the sons of Noah. And then we went into the begats of Noah's children. I'm going to skip down to chapter 10, verse 25 with you. There's only one begat there that you might have trouble with that many people do, not being familiar with the Hebrew tongue. Let's cover it. Chapter 10, verse 25, and it reads, And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now, because that says the earth was divided, it confuses many people. The, the, um, the word Peleg means in the Hebrew tongue to divide. Okay. But all it's talking about is dividing their inheritance of land. The division of the uh, plates of the earth's surface happened long, long before Peleg in the first earth age. So don't, don't let anyone ever confuse you on that point. Now let's skip on, if we may, down to verse 31. And we'll get to verse 31 and we'll pick it up there and, and complete the chapter. This would be the very sons and the Gentiles that were with them. Verse 31, these are the sons of Shem. After their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah. After their generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. <clears throat> so it was. They were the only eight Adamic souls, that's et ha-adam in the Hebrew tongue, those that through the family through which Christ would come. And God's going to protect that family. And not that they are any better than the six-day creation, but they are set aside uh, to tend the, the earth as farmers uh, uh, and um, caretakers thereof. And the only generation that had not intermixed with the, the Nephilim, the fallen angels, <clears throat> and so it was that God used them. Chapter 11, verse 1. Listen carefully. Learn a lesson from our Father's Word. Verse 1 reads, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And they're the oldest language in the world. They all spoke it. Verse 2. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, that, that's Babylon, okay? That's, that's uh, the country of two rivers is what it means in the Hebrew tongue. That's the Euphrates and the Tigris, right there where Iraq would be today. And they dwelt there. Uh, Shinar is just a second name for Babylon, okay? Old Babylon. Verse 3, And they said one to another, Go to, and let us make brick and <clears throat> burn them thoroughly. They couldn't wait for the sun. Let's do it in a hurry with fire. And they had brick of stone and slime had they for mortar. This word slime is, um, is natural asphalt. It comes from the Hebrew word to, ease, to ooze up, meaning to ooze up out of the earth. It's an oil substance. It's a natural asphalt. And boy, it was a slime, and it was a, a uh, coverer and a setter of the brick. You, it didn't come much better. Verse 4, And they said, Go to and let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make us a name, 
lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, you remember what has just happened here. Uh, God brought a flood to destroy the hybrids. That is to say, those that had mixed with the fallen angels, as we read in, in uh, the sixth chapter of this great book. And so that they're up above the flood, they're going to work out their own salvation without God. They're not taking God, in, in, not even into consideration. Now, if you want to know something that will bring God down, when man tries to cut God totally out, goes to perversion, then you can rest assured it will bring God down in one form or the other. So here, they're going to build their own tower to heaven so that they don't have to depend on God to rise above any flood or anything else that God may bring. What a joke. But you know, I think there are people that actually think they're dumb enough to think in that vein. Uh, you cannot... You cannot go around our Father. This, this has to do with those that would clone themselves for eternal life, time after time. It will bring God down. There's only one life giver, and that's, that's our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> so he's going to take a very dim view of this. So as they would say, let us go up, it's going to bring God down. Listen to it carefully. Next verse, verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Um, and uh, so it was. This was after the flood. And, and this is the Tower of Babel, which is a tower of confusion. And certainly many people are confused today when they try to ascertain the very Word of God and the simplicity in which He teaches it, and they can't figure why that upsets Him. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have only one language. And this, and this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. In other words, I think it's time I teach them a little humility. They're getting the big head. They think they can uh, overcome what I may do to any judgment I may bring upon the people, such as the flood. Go to. Let us go down. This is God and the angels. Let us come down. We'll go down to them. And there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so it is that at this time, it is, it is a miracle and a divine intervention whereby there would be about seven dialects he would break them up into, which, is, which make up the languages of today, basically. Verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, all around, and they left off to build the city. He put a stop to it. Probably the languages that they were bro broken up into was Hebrew, Greek, Latin, uh, Teutonic, Tartian, uh, Tartian, Chinese, and Slavic, and others which are dialects of these, which would make seven. And, and so it is to this day that basically all languages come from that root. Verse 9, therefore is the name of it called Babel, which means confusion, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. And, and so it is that you don't ever think that you could outdo our Almighty God. This is one of the main things downfalls of communism. It's why it has never worked. It's why it will never work. Because why? Well, they short circuit and leave God out of the equation. They don't discuss anything with Him. They don't call upon Him. And so it is that it leaves people very hurt, very uh, a harmful way to bring uh, a system upon a people. 
and the people suffer for it. Uh, I know that many people today which are uh, socialist, which is the little sister of communism, who have never fought on an actual battlefield against communism, or you'd know better, then you think, well, that would be all right. Well, it isn't. It's not the way God created us, and he does not like it when you leave him out of the equation. As a matter of fact, he won't tolerate it. And that's why we have multi-languages today. And that's why working out their own salvation brought him down, just as Sodom and Gomorrah, in a few chapters hence, will bring him down again. Perversion. What is perversion? Anything that is not natural. Verse 10, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was an hundred years old and begat Erfaxed two years after the flood. Now, these are begats that you need not my help with, and I want to go all the way down, if I may, and I'm going to let the character generator have time to catch up. We're going to go all the way down to uh, Abraham's time, which will be Abram. So let's jump all the way down to the 26th verse, and when you get there with the character generator, you can pop her up there, and we'll go with that 26th verse of this um, 11th chapter. The begats are fantastic. That's the way it was, and the children came forth. This was their locations. This is where they um, were scattered to. But naturally, the next uh, point will be, as we pick it up in 26, and Tira which means station, lived 70 years and begat Abram. Now, Abram's name will be changed to Abraham, okay? But this, this is Abraham at this time, Nahor and Haran. In other words, there were three brothers um, <coughs> of Terah, and Abram being one of them. Uh, Ab Abram in the Hebrew tongue means a high father. His name will be changed to Abraham, which means the father of many nations, meaning God would make a covenant, and you either align with that covenant, or you don't have God's blessings. Verse 27, now these are the generations of Terah, that's Abraham's father. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. And Lot, of course, would be a nephew of Abram, or Abraham, and it would be Lot that would go with him, and it would be Lot that would settle in Sodom and Gomorrah at a later time. Verse 28, And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. Now, Ur, even to this day, is a point. We even have a, a don't bomb during war point on this particular uh, pyramid-like object that is built here at Ur. Um, Sodom Hussein would even park jets by this particular pyramid-like tower at Ur, knowing we wouldn't bomb it there. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic place from the roots of the very word itself in the nation of Babylon, and, and so it is. Uh, uh, Chaldees is, is um, one of the, there were five dialects of Chal the Chaldee, which was um, uh, of the... Um, the Babylonians, verse 29. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, which is, uh, uh, which her name also will be changed to Sarah. And uh, in other words, an H from the sacred name will be placed in both these names to change them. Why? Because they're covenanted by Almighty God. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishkah. Now, so what you see here is that Sarah and Abram are half brother and sister, have the same father but different uh, mothers. Verse 30, but Sarai was barren, and she had no child. Sarai means princess, um, or and my princess, rather, and it will be changed to Sarah, which is simply princess, God's princess. Verse 31, And Terah took Abram, his son, 
and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees, from Babylon there, to go into the land of Canaan. And they came into Haran and dwelt there. 32 to complete the chapter. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran, in Mount Haran. He died there. So here you have the foundation of the Abrahamic covenant that God will institute. And that covenant will always, why would he call Abram, uh, uh, which would be um, a high father to the father of many nations? Because he was through the son. That is to say, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this laying that foundation. But uh, let's get right into chapter 12. Picking it up there. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, that's Ur, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. Verse 2, And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, listen carefully now. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Do you have any idea of what nation that fits today? Those ten tribes that would go north over the Caucasus Mountains that would be called Caucasians that would settle Europe, many of them later coming to Canada and the Americas, but what is the greatest nation in the world today? And I'm, I'm not bragging on our own nation, the Americas, but why does God bless it the way he does? Is it because we have religious freedom? Is it because we have freedom to teach God's word as it is written without apology to anyone or paying any attention to what some people might call politically correct? Teach God's word, let the chips fall wherever they may. Never apologize for the Word of God. But here, here it is. There, there's, no, there's no accidents. You don't have a great nation without God's blessings. Well, how could you say that, brother? Well, hey, do me a favor. Put your hand in your pocket if you're lucky enough to have a coin there and pull it out of your pocket. What does it say? It says, in God we trust, right? That's why this nation is blessed. And this is why many nations are blessed by it. There, we, there are some nations that wouldn't exist today if it were not for our protection. They need us, and perhaps we need them. But most of all, we need our Father. He's on the throne. He's the one that gives the blessings. And so it is. Many people have known there was more to God's Word since they were a child than they were being taught. It's time that many wake up to the events that transpire in this nation and realize God sent us a, a letter. It's written to us. He expects us to read it so we know what tomorrow brings because it always does. Or a person can stay, remain ignorant. Ignorant is ignorant if ignorant is still. But then you do have God's Word, and this is that contract through Abraham. Verse 4, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Um, and uh, moving on along, at that time that was a very young age. Um, there was no pollutions and people did not age quickly. Methuselah lived to be almost a thousand years old. Verse 5, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that uh, they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. Why? Well, why did he do that? Because God told him to. He obeyed God. Do you? That's the question. Do you? 
Well, well, how do I know? Well, it's written. Have you ever read it? Verse 6. And Abram passed through the land into the place Shechem. Shechem in the Hebrew tongue means the backbone, and probably it was because of a boulder or something that was shaped like that, unto the plain of Moray, and Moray meaning teacher, from which my name Murray comes from. Uh, at Moray, and the Canaanite, the merchant, was then in the land. And they were, they were in that uh, place, and so it was uh, always handy, right? Verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Uh, there was no tower to reach heaven. God came down to him. And do you know what he will do to you today? When you pray, he hears you. He comes to you. Why? He loves you. Do you know why he created you? Last verse, chapter 4, book of Revelation, for his pleasure. If you don't give him any pleasure, he's sure not going to give you any. He loves you. He may not love what you do, but he wants you to return that love. And so it is here that he comes to, he, it pleased him that Abram built this place to worship him. Verse 8, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Haran, Haran or Hai rather, Hai is an interesting word, it means, it means heap or waste, on the east, and there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, what does Bethel mean in the Hebrew time? It means God's house, the house of God. And, and of course, is it not strange that on the other hand, you have Ai, which, which, Hai, which is, it means a heap. It's tore up. Nothing there. Kind of gives a man a choice, does it not? Verse 9, And Abram journeyed going on still further, uh, still toward the south. Ten, and there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And naturally in Egypt you have the Nile, you have plenty of water, and a, a fertile place, and Abram would go there. Our Father blesses his children when they obey him. Make note in your mind, Abram, Abram always obeyed God. God didn't set Abram to one side because he was the biggest, the strongest, the smartest. He set him to one side because he obeyed God, and he loved the Father. He always did what God would ask him to. If, if, if your life begins to kind of fall apart, you kind of wonder which way things went. I, I don't know. Are you obeying God? Well, what, how do I know? Well, have you, you've got to read his letter. He wrote it to you because he loves you. He told you how it was in the history, which we're reading now in the beginning. If you do not understand the beginning, there is no way you will ever understand the end. That's why it is ever, ever so important. So um, Abraham... Um, about 75. His wife was 10 years younger, Sarai. She, she would be 65 at this time. Let's go with the next verse. Verse 11. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. She was beautiful. He said, I, I know when we get there and they know you're my wife, they're going to kill me. Because Pharaoh is going to want you. There, somebody there is going to want you. So uh, let's still tell them. And here you've got um, um, many might say, well, he's going to lie because he's going to tell them, tell them you're my sister. Well, she was. She was his half-sister. That was not incest at this time. This is the way it was as the earth was being populated. Let's go then with the next verse, uh, verse 12. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, this is, my, this is his wife, 
and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. And, and they knew she was beautiful. And th this at the same time lets you know how much he trusts Saria. He, he knows that he can trust her completely and totally. Verse 13, he continues, Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake and my soul shall live because of thee. In other words, you're, you're going to save my life here with these people. Verse 14, And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. Sixty-five, but I mean a beauty uh, at this time. Mature and, um, and fair to look upon. She, again, beautiful. Verse 15, the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. God has a plan. He's already made, he's already blessed Abram or promised a blessing. He's not, uh, divine intervention will always happen. This is why when, when you follow God's plan, Divine intervention will also happen in your life occasionally. You're going to wonder, well, how did that happen? Well, he knows. And he's about to intervene again. Verse 16. And he entreated, let's go with the next verse. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. Oh, yeah, buttered it right up to him. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants. And she asses and camels. He, he, he was rich and he loaded him up because of the beautiful woman. 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. I mean, he put things upon them that was about to destroy them. Verse 18. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What? Is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? God's divine intervention had put uh, boils on them and taken away any desires whatsoever. And things weren't working well at all at Pharaoh's house. It was falling apart. And... Uh, and on a analyzing what had gone wrong, he found Abram out. Verse 19. Why saidest thou, she is my sister? And really she was. So I might have taken her to me to wife. I might have. Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. You get away from us. They were tired of the punishment God had brought down upon them, that is to say, the plagues, and uh, it was not a pretty sight. 20. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, and his wife, and all that he had. They wanted to be rid of them. I mean, they had been nothing but bad news for Pharaoh's house. But in God's divine intervention, they received much goods, much property, and that is to say chattel-type property, movable, and away they were gone. You can rest assured that Pharaoh probably sent enough men along with him to make sure they parted totally out of his command. He wanted nothing to do with that pretty woman, her husband, nor anything that they had because of the plagues God had brought down upon them. Again, what brings God down? Well, in this case, he had made a promise, and he's going to keep it. Therefore, he had to protect Sarah and Abram, Abraham, so that these promises would come to pass, and all of God's children would be blessed. Therefore, he brought these plagues upon uh, probably pretty innocent people. And, but at the same time, God's will was done. And so it was that God on the throne 
So here we have that Tower of Babel where people try to work out their own salvation. Oh, yes, I can do it. I do not need God. Oh, you don't. Well, hey, have a good trip to hell. That's where you're going to end up at. You're, you're, you're never going to amount to anything because you're not going to have God's blessings. See, God's blessings are essential to be successful. God's blessings are essential to have a healthy, normal life going by His health laws and His way whereby you are blessed. And so it is that God blesses those that bless Him. God protects those that follow His way. And that's the way it is. So you see here a little example of what brings God down when men try to go up. When men tried to go up, God has a way of humbling them. 